Bene, credo siamo online, quindi forse conviene spegnere le nostre, i nostri video. Possiamo cominciare? Sono le quattro. Ok. So, Luca? Sì? Mm, introduco io, io. Ciò che non ho capito è, prima di tutto, se, se mi si vede. Sì. E la seconda è se c'è qualcuno che parla inglese, perché io ho, e chiaramente ho... ho preparato l'introduzione in inglese, però se siamo tutti... Does anybody... Uh, does not understand the English? Perché uh, farei la presentazione in, in italiano, chiaramente. Carlo, sì. since we are on YouTube, maybe there are people oh, sorry, on YouTube who not, I, not I forgot. Italian. I forgot, sorry. So, okay. welcome everybody, sorry. Uh, uh, It's a really a great, great pleasure to me to present the 2020 edition of the network Roberto Franceschi workshop. We organize uh, this workshop every year and uh, we organize in conjunction with a conference at Bocconi, which usually takes uh, the full day. And clearly this was not possible this year. And uh, we also decided to limit the meeting to just two hours to keep uh, the attention of the audience uh, in this uh, online workshop. We thought that more than two hours would be, have been too much. And uh, for this reason, I'm going to be extremely brief, extremely brief. Today we have uh, six presentation and time constraint are uh, extremely strict. All the research that uh, are going to be presented today have been uh, awarded by the Roberto Franceschi program, which is a program that supports master and PhD student in the, the writing of the thesis, the research. The There are two important requirements to apply to this program, to the Roberto Franceschi program. The first one is the collection of uh, original data. And the second one is uh, the focus on poverty, inequality, and in general on social distress. And, uh, however, I, I want to stress here that the Roberto Franceschi program is much more than a research founding grant. Since uh, its uh, very beginning, all the beneficiaries of the program become part of the Roberto Franceschi network. And the Roberto Franceschi network is the community of all the winners, let's say, of uh, this and other programs. And we, we share the data of uh, the research we, you collected. We finance the research, but uh, we do much more than this. I, I would say that we, we share experience and let me be a little bit emphatic, uh, we share ideas. So in this spirit today, I'm going to leave the floor to Valentina Rotondi, Sapsi and uh, Oxford University, and uh, Simone Kremaschi, who is at Bocconi University, and they will chair the workshop. Uh, it's nice uh, to me to, to give the floor to Simone and Valentina because they were presenting uh, 
uh, their research in the Roberto Franceschi workshop just a few years ago, and uh, now they are active uh, component of the network. So I would like to thank uh, Valentina and Simone for uh, setting this uh, duty. And uh, I would also thank uh, all uh, the members of the network uh, that uh, I cannot mention. Would like to uh, thank in Intesa San Paolo, all participants to this meeting. And uh, of course, uh, I would also like to thank Luca. So uh, good work and uh, have a nice uh, uh, meeting. So thank you, Carlo, for the introduction. Since we are quite time constrained, we go directly to the presentation of these uh, scholars from different universities. So we start with uh, Giacomo Battiston from Bocconi University. He will present uh, um, uh, a research title, Rescue on Stage, Border Enforcement and Public Attention in the Mediterranean Sea. So just to give you some uh, information with respect to questions, you might want to write your questions in the chat. Um, Giacomo and the other researchers will have 15 minutes and then we have five minutes for, for questions. So thank you so much, Giacomo, the floor is yours. Giacomo, unmute yourself. Sorry, I don't know why, but I had to, sh to stop sharing to unmute myself for some reason. Um, yeah, here we are. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Carlo. And uh, thank you for giving me the chance to present uh, the work that I that I had the chance to, 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 to do with the, with the, the, the Roberto Franceschi uh, scholarship. Um, today I present Rescue on Stage, Border Enforcement and Public Attention in the Mediterranean Sea. This is work in which I, I study border enforcement policy in the Mediterranean context, its consequences for migrants and its determinants. Um, so border enforcement is a policy that virtually every high income country engaging and it's a policy with uh, conflicting policy objectives. On the one hand, it aims to reduce irregular migration, but on the other hand, it tries to ensure that migrants are treated humanely in the process. Uh, this, this contrast is really apparent in the Mediterranean context where migrants leave from North African shores in order to reach Europe, and they do so on unseaworthy boats. Now, European authorities intercept those boats in order to avoid tragedies, but they keep rescues from occurring close to North, Africa sh North African shores in order to deter uh, future migration. So in a way, policy views a, tra uh, a trade-off between increasing safety for migrants uh, by going and, and saving them close to where they live uh, and, and, and preventing future departures by inviting them. Um, and to understand how policy trades off uh, these two objectives, it's important to keep in mind uh, the interaction between migrants, smugglers, governments, but also public scrutiny in destination countries. Indeed, border enforcement and irregular migration is generally is subject to uh, high public attention in, in Europe. And, and this might create complex uh, political, uh, political trade-offs. And uh, in, in particular, migration has been a hotly debated issue um, for a long time now uh, in our political debate. And anecdotally, we have seen that uh, uh, newsworthy events have mattered in how policymakers set, uh, set border enforcement policy in this context. In 2013, for example, Operation Marinostrum started in the wake of a large shipwreck and two shipwrecks in 2015 prompted, uh, uh, prompted the, the increase in the geographical scope of rescue operations during Operation Triton. Um, so this paper, in light of, of these motivations, aims to answer two research questions. The first is how do policymakers balance migrant safety and deterrence when setting rescue policy? And to answer this question, I study policy choices on where migrants are rescued, so how far from uh, Libyan shores. Um, and I focus on this policy instrument because this was the key policy tool from 2014 to 2017 in the central Mediterranean route of migration. I quantify uh, the effect of distance uh, from Libya of rescues on migration outcomes. In particular, I show that the uh, distance increases that risk relying 
on exogenous variation coming from maritime traffic, and in particular, a 10 kilometer in increase in rescue distance, which is roughly half of a standard deviation, increases uh, the, the likelihood of, uh, of dying at sea by two percentage points, um, while um, at the same time, in decreasing distance increases future departures. So um, in, uh, increasing distance by 10 kilometers um, reduces departures after one week by 13%. Uh, according to my, my estimates. And so in light of, of these two uh, main elements, uh, so this, this main trade-off that, uh, that I see in the data, I estimate a dynamic structural model of border enforcement, where I start, that I used to establish policymakers' willingness to accept deaths in order to reduce arrivals and the value of a statistical migrant life for policymakers as revealed by their actions. The second research question that I am to answer with this paper is, how does public attention influence policymakers' choices? I use Google searches data about migration and use articles data from Fativa. And I find that public attention, specifically searches here, um, increase migrant safety, um, in, increase mi migrant safety in the following way. Uh, one standard deviation increases in searches, reduces rescue distance by 0.3 standard deviations. So um, increasing safety for migrants. And what I show within uh, my model is that uh, the mechanism for this to happen and a likely one is that temporary increases in attention make uh, the policymaker more impatient. Like, let me explain myself. Um, and in a temporary increase in, in, in public attention um, make the policymaker more willing to accept future departures in order to improve uh, safety for migrants today and prevent visible deaths. Um, and the effect uh, is persistent both within my model and within uh, reduced form estimates. So uh, let me, for the sake of time and in order to, to use your, your, pressure, your precious time today, uh, just focus on this, this second research question, research question for the purpose of, of, of communicating my work in this workshop. Um, the literature I talk to with my work relates both to border enforcement, and let me just say here that the, the literature on border enforcement in Europe and in the Mediterranean context is quite novel, um, and also it, it contributes to the literature on um, media attention and public attention and how they affect policy making. And I show that both attention, volatility and persistent uh, matter in, in this context. So um, to, to carry out this project, I relied on uh, a novel and an unexplored data set of rescue uh, interception locations for migrants traveling from Libya on the central Mediterranean route of migration. This is a data set that I obtained from Frontex and it reports geolocation for the universe of rescue operations. Now here I depict on map uh, these uh, rescue interceptions in the period from 2014 to 2015. What we observe is that uh, rescue interceptions cluster in front of the coast of Libya around the cities of Sabrata and Tripoli, but they also display um, considerable uh, ge geographical spread. And in the period instead of 2016-17, rescue moved closer to the, to, the Libya, to the Libyan coast, still clustering around the previous two cities. Um, so um, the other important uh, piece of data that I use in, in this research is attention to migration and how it evolves over time. And in particular, I use uh, Google searches about migration and news articles. In this graph, I depict the evolution of, of both of these variables. And as you can see, there is considerable uh, variation over time in the short term. And uh, what I show is that uh, uh, this variation uh, comes from extremely large events in the rescue area, such as uh, this peak in April 2015 that I'm lighting in the slide where uh, that was generated by uh, two large shipwrecks cl claiming the lives of more than 1,000 migrants. And, and in, in other cases, though, uh, peaks are generated by uh, important uh, by events that are that have a, a smaller, uh, a comparably smaller death toll, for example, or that has more in nature, however important, such as uh, the death of a drone uh, Syrian toddler, uh, Alan Kurdi, whose body washed up on Turkish shore uh, in November 2015. And here I'm depicting the peak generated by this news uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, my, in my graph here. Um, the important and last point that I want to make in, uh, in, with this slide is that there's a considerable co correlation between uh, measuring 
um, attention with migration articles and searches, which is striking because uh, migration articles, uh, I, I collected them uh, using a very fine grade selection of terms um, relating to migration. Now, let me fly over the model and in particular uh, over its structure. Um, so in my model, in a nutshell, uh, migrants uh, buy crossings for, from smugglers and travel uh, from Libya to Italy at risk of, of shipwreck. Now the policymaker chooses where to save migrants. However, higher distance implies a uh, high, high, higher risk for migrants. And that's something that I established uh, using exogenous variation in, in maritime traffic. Um, now, migrants and smugglers forecast future distance with present one, and so future departures decrease uh, with present distance. And that's uh, something that I explore um, uh, using high frequency data on uh, the location of rescue interceptions joined with departures. Now, the policymaker viewing this trade off minimizes present and future deaths and arrivals. And it views an intertemporal trade-off between safety and deterrence. So uh, increasing safety for migrants um, may come at the cost of increasing departures tomorrow. So um, what I do in this paper is I also augment this intertemporal trade-off by, um, by, by um, stating that policymakers care more about outcomes in high attention period when they are more visible. Um, in particular, let me elaborate with uh, some reduced form evidence on this point. Uh, so the impact of attention on, on rescue distance is the first thing that I want to show. Um, and to quantify the impact of, of searches on distance, I estimate, uh, um, uh, I estimate regressions of distance on uh, attention and different lags uh, by controlling for long-term variation, so with year and quarter of the year fixed effects. Uh, but also for an auto, uh, allowing for an autocorrelated error structure. And I find uh, here, uh, I show my results in this graph, uh, you can see at time zero, the, uh, the, the, the time of the rescue. And uh, um, um, on the, on the right-hand side, uh, you, you have future attention. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have past levels of attention. Now, what you can see is that attention in the past has a negative effect on distances. And it becomes um, significant uh, uh, after after one month and a half. Uh, however, uh, it displays an amplifying and persistent pattern. Um, and here, notice that uh, the the confidence intervals that I'm displaying are correct uh, are both erroneously corrected for the many hypotheses I'm testing. Um, I also show that this effect is uh, is persistent to instrumenting. Um, attention with newsworthy sports events. Um, however, I want to focus on other parts of the paper for today. So, uh, in particular, first, um, um, do policymakers or NGOs drive the effect in this case? And what I do in order to document whether uh, which which is the more likely explanation is I interact the the uh, the value of attention at a given time with the proportion of migrants saved by the NGOs in a given period going from zero to one. Here in this table, I display these regressions separately for different lags of attention and NGO involvement. And um, as you can see, uh, consistently, attention has a negative effect, as I was saying before. However, uh, the NGO involvement in the rescue area tends to reduce uh, this effect. And, uh, this becomes apparent um, on the on the third to to sixth lag. So in a way, this seems to say that institutions, so Frontex or or the Italian government, are at the heart of this uh, correlation between attention and distance rather than than NGOs. Now uh, another thing. To go. Sorry. Three minutes to go. Three minutes. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, let me uh, go to to the substance uh, of the model. Uh, so the important part that of of, of my model are that um, uh, the policymaker minimizes deaths and uh, arrivals at the same time, but it views them uh, it views um, deaths and arrivals as as more important to to his or her loss when attention is higher. Okay, and that's the, the main uh, element of uh, relating to attention of my model. Now, what this means if that is, is there is a, a shock to attention hitting, um, here I plot some impulse response functions coming from the estimated model, 
uh, when uh, when a shock to tension hits, uh, distance decreases, um, and it does so um, in an amplified and persistent way. Why it is um, amplified? Because uh, a first uh, decrease in distance results in a higher level of departures, which lower um, uh, distance even more because the policymaker views a higher risk of shipwrecks for for migrants, uh, for 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 many more migrants, um, and. Uh, uh, what is also interesting about the, the dynamics of attention that I focus on in this presentation is that uh, um, they are dependent of, on the level of, of, persistent that, of persistence of the attention shock. And in particular, if an attention shock is more persistent, then it is less important in the eyes of the policymaker. Why? Because attention here um, really um, uh, really um, affects the intertemporal trade-off that the policymakers uh, views by uh, making more uh, more the present more relevant with respect to the future. Now, if attention increases uh, temporarily, say just for this period, and then it reverts back to its level, then the present becomes uh, much more important than than the future period. However, if attention increases forever, then it will increase the value of having, uh, say, good outcomes for the policymaker, both in the present and in the future. And then it will uh, uh, sort of leave the, the incentives of the policymaker unchanged. So um, in conclusion, in this paper, I use high frequency georeference data on risk interceptions in the Mediterranean Sea to establish the following uh, facts. The policymakers face a safety arrival trade-off when setting border enforcement policy, and this trade-off is intertemporal. Further, the public attention influences how the trade-off is solved. Uh, using a structural model of policy setting, I show that uh, uh, historical policy has resulted in a high toll. Uh, sorry, I didn't go, the time to go through this today. Uh, and especially that public attention has a persistent impact and that persistent in attention itself uh, reduces its influence on policy. So temporary shocks are more in important in affecting uh, policy in this context. So thank you for your attention. I I'll stop here for, for questions. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Giacomo, for your amazing presentation and your amazing work. We have a question coming from the uh, audience. So Asia from uh, um, the network Franceschi uh, would like to ask you something. So Asia, please switch your camera on and your mic. Hello. Uh, hello, Giacomo. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I'm uh, Asi Pisarevska from Erasmus uh, University, Rotterdam. Uh, and I'm interested, maybe I didn't catch it very well, but which language did you use uh, for searches and for news articles? And then which policymakers did you consider? European, Italian, English? Uh, can you please elaborate on this? Thanks. Sure. Great and important question. Um, so the language uh, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, that I'm using for Google searches and uh, for articles is Italian. So I'm focusing on Italy in terms of public attention. Um, and the policymakers I, I am considering are um, the Italian government and Frontex. Uh, um, now, uh, the important uh, point that I have to stress for the purpose of this presentation is that they tend to share similar objectives in terms of both recognizing that reducing that is an objective, but also recognizing deterrence for irregular migration as an objective in policy. Uh, if, there, if there are other questions, I'll stop here to, to answer them. Thank Otherwise, you. I can go on. Are there any, any other questions from the audience? Okay, I recommend you that you can uh, register in the chat for questions. So uh, Giacomo, you have two minutes more if you want to add so, something. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 can I, yeah. Oh yeah, Carlo, do you want to say something? No, just maybe it's not even a question, it's a provocation, but after reading uh, your paper, don't you think that after reading your paper, policymakers now have a third policy instrument in their hand? <laughs> so yeah. moving away attention from the cost, probably in the interior of uh, North Africa. Yeah, yeah, let me, let, me, uh, let me stress this point. I think this is uh, really interesting. I'm. Um, looking at the case of uh, the 2014-2017 the, the political climate, which was a, a political climate really shying away from attention 
relation to migration. And uh, this is a bit different from, say, the political climate that we observed in, uh, for example, in, uh, in 2000, uh, 18, 19, where uh, Lega was uh, was a part of the government uh, in Italy, and there I think policy at that point was really uh, using attention as an instrument, using standoffs, etc. Um, and 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 I think this is an important avenue that I'd like to probably uh, study in the future and see how really the government now. Uh, aside from my research, which I think is not their main concern, uh, really takes into account um, attention and tries to influence it in the first place. Yeah. Uh, if I can also add, I, do we have 30 seconds? You have 30 seconds, yes. And uh, Alessio, if you want to write your question here in the chat, then we can um, um, send this question directly to Giacomo, because unfortunately we don't have... Um, ah, okay, so let me just thank Fondazione Franceschi because a, a part that I haven't had the time to show this work um, was uh, was really so wouldn't have been possible without Fondazione Franceschi. It was like in the midst of the slides I had to jump. Um, I had uh, the chance to collect uh, and to uh, classify in terms of political leaning. Uh, newspaper articles about migration in Italy, and they were really instrumental in showing that the effects that they find are driven by objective coverage rather than coverage leaning on uh, on some political side. Um, and I think that's uh, yeah, that's something that I wanted to communicate also about the dynamics of attention and also to touch a, a bit upon uh, Carlos' point. So thank you so much. Thank you, Giacomo, for your amazing presentation. Now I leave the floor to Simone. Okay, so I would ask uh, Sofia and Anna Elena to share the screen, their screen, and I will introduce them in, in the meantime. So Sofia just finished her Master of Science at Bocconi in Economics and Management of Government and International Organization, and Anna Elena also finished the, the master at Bocconi and is now um, a PhD at the University in Economics at the University of Siena. And uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Simone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today. I am Sofia, and together with Anna Elena, we wish we she'll intervene later. Um, we are going to present our research, which is called Life Debts and Modern Slavery and which deals with the trafficked Nigerian women here in Italy. Uh, I wanna thank Fondazione Franceschi because thanks to their scholarship, uh, we had this amazing opportun opportunity of interviewing Nigerian women here in Italy. And uh, um, our research is uh, quite extensive. Today, for the sake of time, we will just briefly touch upon some of the main results that we have obtained. And we would also like to focus on the methodology that we followed. Um, so, before uh, starting with our main objective, let's just briefly focus on uh, the context that we observed and from which we started. Human trafficking is unfortunately a still very present phenomenon today, and it can be considered a form of modern slavery in the sense that the people that are trafficked are treated as commodities. Um, so it is fundamentally a violation of human rights which stems from uh, uh, deep socioeconomic inequalities, both within countries and uh, across countries. So in our case, uh, in the country of Nigeria, and then across Nigeria and Italy, of course. Uh, trafficked women uh, put their lives in the hands of the traffickers because they see no other option. So uh, sometimes they might understand what will come later, but still they decide to face this journey just because they do not see any other opportunity for their future. Uh, in Italy, we see that this is reflected in the number of particularly women uh, that arrived in the last years with an uprising trend, especially from Nigeria. And this is then reflected on the number of assisted victims of human trafficking, which in 2017, for example, were over 1,000, and of these 1,000, more than 85% were women. Given this context, uh, we had three objectives. 
First of all, we wanted to collect information on rescued Nigerian women here in Italy and create an original data set, a novel data set that was not present at the time of our research. Then we split the research. We're actually presenting two theses today. Anna Elena focused on the migration decisions of the women and the socioeconomic background, uh, while I focus on the anti-trafficking programs here in Italy and the services that they offer to the women once they enter our integration program. Um, given this objective, our first uh, task was to travel to seven different anti-trafficking associations here in Italy. And uh, the association were chosen together with Forum Zuguaglianza Diversità, in particular in the person of Andrea Morneroli, which helped uh, us a great lot. And we visited them uh, last year from July to September. And the women that we interviewed were chosen with a convenient sampling technique. Uh, we couldn't just uh, randomly pick the women, although it, it might have been optimal for our research uh, because of very obvious ethical concerns. Uh, the women had already entered our integration program, um, but every woman was at different stage of their path to reintegration and to uh, dealing with the traumas that they had experienced during the journey and during the time they spent in Italy under bondage. So the association actually chose the women for us that were deemed ready to face our questioner and at the same time that were willing to share their experience with us. Um, the interview was held in English, lasted from 20 to 40 minutes, and were held in the presence of me, Anna Elena, and just the other uh, girl. And uh, they were, of course, we also gave them the possibility to skip any questions and or to stop the questioner altogether, again, even at the expense of our research, because uh, ethical concerns were, of course, paramount to us. Also, anonymity was ensured. Can you see my screen? Okay. So um, the questionnaire includes 76 questions in covering an extensive area of inquiry um, from the biographic information on the women, their uh, education, cultural values, and uh, information on the family background to the decision to leave Nigeria and the features of the agreement uh, with the traffickers up to the first reception in Italy and the recovery path with the association and access to job opportunities and healthcare facilities. The, um, the final sample is composed by 38 women, mostly coming from states located in the southern part of Nigeria. And as the main reports have uh, previously highlighted, uh, um, the victims of trafficking are usually very young. Indeed, 53% of the girls in our sample were 19 or younger when just arrived. Um, in order to understand their economic um, background, we employed uh, the poverty scorecard, which is a tool that uses 10 low cost indicators from Nigeria's 2012 um, General Household Panel Survey to estimate the likelihood that a household has a per capita consumption below the national poverty line. And uh, for example, we can see that uh, women coming from the cities have a significant lower probability of being under the national poverty line compared to those coming from the villages. And looking at their educational background, uh, around 18% of them did not study at all. And those who studied report the average number of uh, around nine years of education, which is consistent with the national average. Looking at uh, the reasons pushing uh, the women into this uh, risky migration project, uh, the most mentioned are the economic difficulties of the family and the job search. Other reasons emerged beyond uh, those fixed uh, alternatives are the um, desire of keeping studying or escaping from bad situations at home. For example, parents' decision to make the girl endure genital mutilation or early marriages and the desire of helping the family. Many girls express uh, this strong feeling of responsibility towards their, fa their family, often because uh, they are the firstborn or um, their parents' health state was poor. And this uh, caring attitude is confirmed by findings concerning culture, uh, which have been observed through questions taken from the World Value Surveys. 
Indeed, feminist ties appear to be very strong in the sample. And the autonomy index shows that um, most of the women consider as important values in life obedience and uh, religious faith more than independence and determination. Moving on to the process of recruitment, uh, we observe that uh, the recruiters lured the, um, most of the interviewees into migration by providing them higher remunerated job opportunities uh, at destination, but also educational opportunities. And primarily the um, recruiters are friends or neighbors in Nigeria, but even in some cases, parents and uh, other relatives. Mm, in, the, um, in the attempt uh, to um, investigate the awareness of the women regarding uh, this uh, in-depth migration project uh, they embarked on, we asked them uh, uh, if, um, if they knew what was ahead of them before leaving and which information they received concerning several features of the immigration project. Um, for example, the amount, the existence of a debt, the length of the journey, the means of travel, and so on. Um, at a glance, the figure on the, on the right uh, um, reveals that um, um, the share of women informed about the conditions of this uh, migration project um, is lower than or equal to 50% for almost all the features bar the country of destination. And for what concerns the, um, the debt, um, around half of the women in the sample knew that they had to repay a debt once arrived, but the amount, the currency, were non, uh, not always clearly specified. At destination, the, um, the range of the actual debt goes from 18,000 euros to 40,000 euros. Um, finally, it seems relevant to mention that 71% uh, of the women um, have uh, taken the juju oath, which is a magical ritual during which the women uh, swear oaths in order to ensure compliance with the agreement. And so repaying the debt, respecting the traffickers, never reporting to the police. And it is considered a solemn oath. Um, and women uh, strongly believe that if, it, if they do not repay the debt, uh, terrible things like uh, uh, madness or illness or uh, death will befall them and their families. Lastly, in the attempt to investigate uh, the bargaining power of the women in uh, the decision-making process, uh, it has been asked to assess uh, um, the level of influence exerted on the decision by the various actors uh, involved. And on the basis of this, the decision has been classified as autonomous when the woman is willing to leave but her family is not, shared when both the woman and her family are willing to enter the sponsored migration agreement, and imposed when the woman is not willing to leave but her family or other subjects are. And it has been run a multinomial logistic regression in order to study the relationship between the nominal outcome variable uh, type of decision and various uh, independent variables uh, regarding the women, her um, family and uh, her, her cultural values. And what, what emerges is that uh, um, as the, the women grow up, uh, the probability of um, suffering an imposed decision compared to making an autonomous one decreases, holding constant the level of education and poverty likelihood, and education has a, a decisive role too. Indeed, uh, having studied lowers the probability of uh, uh, suffering an imposed decision. Anna Elena, you have three minutes. What? You, you so, still have three okay. minutes. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. I'll take back uh, uh, the presentation for the moment. Okay, so to conclude, I'll just briefly share some of my uh, results. As I said in the beginning, I mainly focused on uh, uh, association services and their integration programs here in Italy. Uh, this slide just summarizes the main services that it, we tried to assess during the research, um, which is still uh, under development. We're still trying to perfect the results that we obtained. Uh, today, I'll just uh, like to highlight a couple of results and examples of our research. Um, I'll start with uh, the channels through which uh, the associations were able to find the girls. On average, our sample had spent two years in Italy before entering our integration uh, program. And the girls do not escape their captors because as Anna was saying, there are two very important components. 
On one hand, the girls feel like they have to repay the debt that they owe to the traffickers, although illegal. And on the other hand, the juju swears uh, really puts up psychological holds on them and on their families as well, that sometimes ask them to stay with the captors in order to avoid the bad um, consequences of the juju swear. Uh, the associations helps the girls leaving their captors in two ways, an indirect way by sharing information with the migrant community and spreading the words about their integration programs. And we see that this is more effective when the girls had passed uh, two or three years under the streets before being found. The longer the girls had stayed on the street, the more important the direct channel became, uh, meaning uh, we refer to the direct channel, uh, meaning the street unit activities performed by the association and the operators, which directly go on the streets and talk with the girls in order to slowly pursue them to leave their captors and to enter our integration program. While uh, in the indirect way, the girls in most of the cases self-reported to the association and were willing to enter our integration path by themselves. Uh, a second example is uh, provided by the uh, services regarding job finding opportunities. In the table, we summarized uh, the main job that the uh, women that we interviewed were doing at the time of the interviews. Uh, unfortunately, most of them had not found a job yet. But what we observed was that the girls that actually had found a job were also the ones that reported a better health and a better knowledge of the Italian language. This is very relevant because we statistically proved that both these aspects were increased uh, by, the, by the other services offered by the association. So staying longer in the association, taking advantage of their courses and their information, um, increased the health of the women and their knowledge of the Italian language. So again, uh, the second examples um, provide an example on how the association slowly uh, gives to the women the tools to have a better life here in Italy. Um, as I said, this, is, uh, this was a brief presentation uh, of our research, we are, which we are still developing now. And we thank you very much for your attention. We thank uh, Fondazione Franceschi because without their scholarship, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, the women, which of course um, have our greatest uh, gratitude for uh, were being willing to share their past with us and their experience. So thank you very much. I hope we still have time for some questions if you want. Thank you, Sofia, and thank you, Anna Elena. This is a really fascinating work. Uh, we, we already have one question from a member of the network. Juan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hi. Uh, great work, uh, Sofia and Anna Elena. Um, I thought it was it is very inspiring to see uh, what you're doing, and also very inspiring to see what the associations are doing. Um, what I was wondering here is if um, whenever we apply your research to the role of the associations and what kind of skills the people working in the associations have, um, what would be your advice of which skills these people need to have in order to be able to help this group of women better? Because at the end, the associations are doing such a great work as you rightly pointed, but what are they lacking? What are the skills that they still need to develop to be able to help these women migrants in a better way? Uh, well, this is a uh, great question. Um, I think uh, what uh, uh, the women that we interviewed were still showing some difficulties in was uh, accepting the time that is needed to uh, completely recover and have a chance here in Italy. Uh, this is completely understandable in the sense that those are very young women. They had mine and Anna Elena age on average. And of course they came to Italy having these big dreams about their future. And once they come here, they had to face this very harsh reality. Um, so sometimes they did not really understand uh, why, the, were they not able to enter society as soon as they uh, thought they were ready? 
um, while they still had to go through psychological uh, counseling and also to uh, specific course in, courses to train in Italian and also in uh, um, like general job trainings. So I think one aspect that can be um, improved that we need to focus on is uh, uh, helping them understand what is going on and why it is so difficult uh, to enter the Italian society and in general uh, a society wherever they'd like to go. I don't know if Anna Irena has uh, something to add. No, it's, it's okay. Okay. Okay, so we still have one minute, so I will add one question. Uh, that is, so first of all, really great work. Uh, really, it's, it's really impressive to see the results of, uh, of what you did. So my question was, uh, you emphasized the, um, the aspect of uh, coercion that the, the, the brokers and the people that uh, these, these women uh, met uh, in Italy exerted on them. But we, we know that sometimes uh, the relationship with uh, with brokers such such as Madame could be also one that is uh, uh, instrumental. No, so these people could also be seen as someone that helped you in uh, in managing a difficult situation, uh, poverty, and all the constraints that we know they are exposed to. So I was wondering if you also found something along the, uh, those lines, and if not, I wonder if this could not be due to the fact that you interviewed these uh, people while they were in the already in a program, right? So already after uh, taking a decision to exit from, uh, from sex work and, and everything. Okay, um, maybe I could answer. Um, I, um, I think that um, the, the girl we, um, that we interviewed were, um, did not uh, have this, uh, this kind of experience with the, their madame. Um, the reason maybe it's that uh, they exit the this uh, the this um, this uh, situation, um, but some of them um, told us that uh, uh, they were actually very close friends or also relatives. Um, but their the trust then uh, um, disappeared after after all. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, the bondage then uh, broke, and uh, also you know, the trust with it. Um, okay, then, uh, thank you. Yeah. So, unfortunately, we have to go on. There will, would be many other questions to be asked, uh, but I will give the floor to to Valentina again. So thank you so much for this uh, really inspiring presentation. Now I invite Marco Marinucci, um, PhD candidate at the University of Milano Bicocca to switch his camera on and share the screen. He's going to present this paper called Social Exclusion in, uh, in Immigrants, How Intergroup Social Connections Influence Its Impact. Thank you, Marco, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Valentina. Hi everybody, and today I'm going to present the work that is the core um, work of my PhD thesis at the University of Milano Bicocchi from a social psychological perspective. And I basically um, aim, I aimed at investigating the psychological impact of persistent social exclusion in immigrants and focusing on how intergroup social connections with different social groups that are the national groups like Italians on, and other immigrants can influence the, the, the impact of social exclusion. So um, in 1995, Baumastro in their paper, The Need to Belong, stated that human beings have a purposive drive to form and maintain at least a minimum quantity of interpersonal relationship. And those relationships need to be satisfying, positive, and significant. And the core question here is, is that they pointed that um, social relationships have a fundamental role for human health. But what happened when those relationships where people are not able to establish such important social relationships? It can be the case when people are socially excluded. And from a psychological perspective, social exclusion is defined as the experience of being kept apart from others, physically or emotionally. And social exclusion has severe 
impact both at the psychological and at the physical level, because for example, social exclusion causes negative emotions and our feelings, it increased the risk of suicide. And from a physical impact, it can lead to several health conditions and even increased risk for mortality. And in our, in our societies, there are specific social groups like marginalized or disadvantaged social groups that are persistently exposed to, episode, to social exclusion. And those are groups like immigrants, homeless people, prisoners, and older individuals. Immigrants in particular are persistently and purposely exposed to social exclusion along several levels of analysis, starting from their interpersonal individual level, because often immigrants are exposed to post-migration stressors that often include difficulties in establishing new relationship in the society or the, the sense of loss with and of loss from home communities and people in their home country. At the intergroup level, at the social level, they often are victims of prejudice, racism, and hostility from the local communities. And the macro social socioeconomic level, they are often victims of discrimination in employment, housing, and policies. At, and even at the political level, they, they, they have limited social, legal, and citizen, citizenship rights. So immigrants are um, one of those social groups that are pervasively and persistently exposed to social exclusion. But from a psychological perspective, little is known about what are the psychological implications of such a prolonged experience of social exclusion. One of the most important models in this sense is the temporary threat model from Williams, where the, when the authors described how individual reacts over time to ostracism and social exclusion in, in general. In the beginning, people feel negative effects and a threat to fundamental being, needs of belonging, self-esteem, control and meaningful existence. After, afterward, in the immediate stage, in the reflective stage, people try to cope with, the, with social exclusion, acting prosocially or aggressively, trying to fortify the threatened needs. And crucially, the model states that if ostracism, if social exclusion persists over time, people would inescapably enter the resignation stage. That is a condition characterized by chronic feelings of alienation, depression, helplessness, and unworthiness. However, this part of the model is the only part that talks about the, con the consequences of persistent social exclusion over time, but literature lacks of empirical evidence of this link between persistent exclusion and resignation stage. L literature lacks evidence of the temporal framework that resignation takes to develop. And even if there exists some intervening factor that can shape the, the development of the resignation stage. So in this research project, I aim at investigating the psychological impact of persistent social exclusion, focusing on immigrants as a persistently excluded social groups, and also addressing the role of intergroup social connections with the national groups like Italians and with other immigrants in moderating the relationship between social exclusion and resignation over time. And to do so, uh, during my during the, the three years of the PhD program, I conducted five studies that I'm going to briefly present now. The first one consisted in a um, correlational cross-sectional study that provided preliminary evidence of the moderating role of intergroup social connection. The study was conducted on under 12 men, asylum seekers, that mainly came from Western Africa, and 86.4% came from Western Africa, like Nigeria, Senegal, Ivory Coast. Some of them came from Asia, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and the remaining participants from other countries in Africa. And the data were collected within Italian hosting centers in CAS, the Center Centro di Accoglienza Straordinari, and we used self-reported questionnaires translated in English, French, and Italian. With, and we measured the self-perception of social exclusion in their daily life, the amount of intergroup social connections with Italian peoples and with Italian people and with other immigrants, and their level of resignation, measuring the four outcomes of depression, alienation, unworthiness, and the helplessness. And during the procedures, cultural linguistic mediators supported the data collections, and we also refunded the participants. Basically, the results point that social connection with other immigrants as a risk factor against the negative consequences of social exclusion. In this moderation analysis, briefly, we found that for those who were mainly connected with other immigrants, the thick blue line, social exclusion had predicted stronger resignation stage whereas those who were less connected with other immigrants reported a lower relationship between social exclusion and resignation. 
Oppositely, we found that social connection with Italians had a protective was a protective factor again against the resignation stage, because we found that those who were mainly connected with Italians, this thick blue line, in those who were mainly connected with Italians, social exclusion was not associated with the resignation stage, whereas those who were less connected with Italians presented a stronger connections between social exclusion and resignation. And these results held constant also when we considered simultaneously the connection with other immigrants and Italians. And those with prevailing connection with Italians showed a protective effect against the resignation stage, whereas those with prevailing, with prevailing connections with other immigrants show the risk factors against the resignation stage. So as a summary we found with this study, we found we provided preliminary evidence of a link that mm, social groups persistently exposed to social exclusion can develop resignation stage, and also of the protective role of social connection with national groups that in this case were Italians, and of the risk factor for the consequences of social exclusion of being segregated and mainly connected with other immigrants. But here we could only have correlational data with self-reported measure. And in the second study, we aim at overcoming this limitation by conducting a secondary data analysis on an already, already existing data sets on first generation immigrants in Europe. This data set was part of the Cheese for You program that was an ongoing project in Europe on serving adolescents in schools. And we selected the 2,206 first generation immigrant participants that the data come, came from Germany, the UK, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And they were connect, collected in the regular national school settings. Here, the peculiarity of this data set is that they measured social exclusion with an, object, an objective indicator. So rather than focusing on the self-perceived self social exclusion of the participants, they relied on the classmates of the immigrant participants. And basically, they computed this index that indicated how many times the classmates participants intended to exclude the immigrant participant. So it's quite an objective indicator of social exclusion that can uh, rather than a self-reported index. And the data, set, the data set also contained uh, information regarding intergroup social connections and on the resignation stage, health, psychological health outcomes. And basically the results confirmed what we already found in our preliminary study. So such as those who were mainly connected with other immigrants presented a stronger association between the objective social exclusion and the resignation stage. Whereas those who were mainly connected with native people in each country presented a lower association between social exclusion and the resignation stage. So in this study, we could replicate our mm, preliminary evidence of the of link between objective exclusion and the resignation stage, and in particular of the moderating role of intergroup social connection. But we still here have correlational data, so we couldn't look at how social exclusion and how resignation developed over time. And we tried to do so in, in the third study, which is a longitudinal study that was uh, continuously continued upon the collection of the first study I presented here. But in, in this longitudinal study, we aim at investigating the temporal development of the chronicity of social exclusion and of the development of the resignation stage. So um, it was a three-wave longitudinal study, and each wave of the collection occurred at that three months interval. And the first wave of the study was the study one. So you know, it was the, the first wave of the study. And then we collected, we added two more waves, ending up with 70 participants in the end of the study. And in this study, we focused on the um, reciprocal relationship Sorry, over time. Three minutes to go. Three minutes to go. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, here we basically found that social exclusion predicted resignation stage after a six months interval. So in this study, we could found that we found a causal evidence that previous level of social exclusion predicted effectively resignation and that it occurred in a six months interval. In the fourth study, we looked at the, um, how social intergroup, intergroup social connection could moderate this longitudinal association. We, we use the same data set we um, I've just presented now, but we um, run specific, specific analysis on the role of intergroup social connections. So we, at first we computed, we um, analyzed how social connection with these two different groups occurred over time. And then we 
tested how the development over time of these different intergroup social connections affected the longitudinal relationship between social exclusion and resignation, controlling for previous level of resignation. And here again, we can confirm the pattern of results that I presented so far. So those who were mainly connected with Italians presented a negative association between exclusion and resignation over time, meaning that especially the most excluded immigrants benefited from the development of social connections with Italians. Whereas increasing connections with immigrants over time aggravated the impact of social exclusion. Okay, we skip on this and present the last study that is an experimental study that we um, conducted on both asylum seekers and on voluntary immigrants, um, like economic immigrants. So we could discriminate between the, the forced immigrants that were just arrived in Italy within a three years interval and the voluntary immigrants who have been long staying in Italy for at least are about 15 years. And the experimental study consisted in showing immigrants with eight scenarios, eight vignettes, that described either a situation of social inclusion or social exclusion that occurred by either Italians or immigrants. So for instance, here we show examples of vignettes are you are sitting in a crowded bus of Italians and nobody sits, sits next to you. And this is the exclusion Italian condition and so on. And here we measured the some intergroup social connections and the emotions that people would feel if they would be in the situation described. And here again, we could confirm this the pattern of results also on the immediate emotional impact of social exclusion. And we show that those who are mainly connected with other immigrants uh, presented a higher emotional cost of social exclusion, whereas those who are mainly connected with Italians presented a lower emotional impact of social exclusion. But these especially uh, in particular the moderating effect of connections with, its, with Italians uh, held only for forced immigrants, but not for voluntary immigrants. So in conclusion, in this study, I could, this is a map that describes all the findings. So we, we could um, show that social exclusion over time predicts negative psychological effect, and that connection with low status immigrants, with other immigrants, aggravated the negative impact of, of social exclusion. Whereas connections with high status national group, especially for forced short-term short immigrants, protected from the, ne the negative impact of social exclusion. So in conclusion, we, could found that we found that intergroup social connections can influence how social exclusion impact on the short term and long term health. And we, highlight, we could highlight the benefits of bridging connection with the national groups and the risk of societal segregation in particular um, against the negative implication of social exclusion, highlighting how social integration of immigrants are fundamentally based on the social relationship they can establish in the society. And thank you. This is the, the group I conducted the research with, the, my supervisor and um, Professor Paolo Riva, postdocs and the research assistant. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. And so we have uh, four minutes to go for, for questions. Are there any questions from the, from the audience? Okay, if not, I try to go first. Um, mm -hmm. So I really think this is a fascinating, fascinating work and is really embedded within uh, our main social issues and social problems related to um, migration and social exclusion um, that in the time of COVID could be even ex exacerbated because uh, I, um, I expect, for instance, uh, migrants and specifically forced migrants to be much more touched by uh, social isolation than, uh, than other group of people. So what, what what if you if you want to pick maybe one um, suggestion for policymakers or for um, like uh, third sector um, professionals, what would you say? So we see that this negative correlation, we see this uh, important uh, relationship with respect to social connectedness. But uh, what we can do to tackle this issue? Well, I would say try to um, structure occasion to put immigrants in contact with Italians. That is one of uh, a big issue because the social psychological literature has been showing that intergroup contact between different social groups have um, very good benefits. For example, for example, it can reduce prejudice among the majority groups. It can improve health as I've shown in this presentation among the minority groups, but something that is quite hard to, to realize that as a practical intervention is putting people into contact because if contacts can work, it's very hard to 
put such different social groups into contact, contact each other. So if I would suggest something as to policymakers, it would be to develop a way to organize, to put people in contact, organize, I don't know, a specific intervention that could bring together such different social groups. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for your yeah. answer, for your presentation. And now I leave the floor to Simone, who's introducing the next speaker. Yes. Carlo, do you want to say something? No, just uh, I'll write to Marco. Ah, okay. Okay, so thank you, Marco. Great work. Um, it's now the turn of Ambra and Francesca, so I would ask you to sh please share your screen. And in the meantime, let me introduce Awamra Sec and Francesca Miserocchi, who are both doing their uh, PhD in political economy in the United States at Harvard University, and will present a study titled The Economic and Social Integration of Refugees in Italy, a pilot study. The floor is yours. You should unmute yourself, Francesca. Okay, so now I, I'm unmuted. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity. So uh, the motivation of our study is the dramatic increase uh, of arrivals of asylum seekers over the past uh, five, six years, which, uh, oh, sorry, I think uh, I cannot. Uh, um, Okay, which uh, led also to created also social tensions that sometimes culminated in acts of physical violence and discrimination, as we can see from these uh, headlines from local newspaper articles. And so, like in such a context, we think that it's crucial to develop a better understanding of the determinants of economic and social integration. And in particular, we focus in this study in trying to understand how the city in which asylum seekers are assigned to influences their outcomes. So the, the questions that we will try to answer are two. So the first one is whether the match between the destination city's labor market and the labor, the labor market of migrant city of origin influence the economic, the economic integration of refugees. And the second question is whether the match between cultural beliefs of destination city and migrant city of origin influence the social integration of refugees and asylum seekers. Therefore, I mean, we, we, try, to, uh, we try to investigate what is the influence of the neighborhood environment on social and economic integration? And the main object of uh, this study is therefore to, uh, to like, and also to collect like new measures. So I will start by like briefly descri describing the allocation process because like all of our identification strategy relies on the quasi-random assignment of refugees to different cities. And then I will describe the pilot study that we conducted on summer 2019. And then Ambra will describe the empirical strategy and preliminary results. So, uh, so something about the context. So the assignment of migrants, basically as migrants arrive in Italy, they are first uh, redirected to the closest hotspot where they are identified and then they are sent to regions and basically assignment to region depends on regional availability and uh, uh, each region has like fixed quotas and quotas are designed based on population size, GDP and services. And then like once migrants are assigned to a region, then they are assigned to a city and they're assigned either to CAS center or SPLAR centers. And our strategy is based on the assumption that we will try to test of basically the assumption is that uh, individuals are quasi randomly allocated to cities in the sense that they cannot choose uh, the city where they will end up uh, in the SPRAR or CAS. So these are, so we will try to focus on, so we, 
conducted our survey in SPRAR, but we would like to focus both uh, on uh, CAS and SPRAR. So this is the geographical distribution of uh, migrant of uh, people hosted in CAS and SPRAR. And we see that uh, we know that uh, uh, CAS are like bigger and like 80% of uh, asylum seekers were hosted there. And uh, asylum seekers remain in uh, Kassen Sprar from six months to two years, and then they are free to relocate and move uh, wherever they want. So something more about like the pilot study. So, uh, and uh, yeah, the data that we will try to use uh, uh, to answer the research questions that I outlined before. So we will use data on like about data from the pilot uh, study. And then we will also use data like public administrative data at the municipality level to get information on city characteristics. And finally, we will use some data provided by the Ministry of the Interior on democratic characteristics, demographic characteristics of people hosted in CAS. So um, about the pilot, so most of the variables we were interested in were not uh, asked before. And uh, therefore, in August uh, 2019, we conducted a survey among 89 refugees uh, and asylum seekers. And uh, we conducted the survey in three Italian regions, in Piedmont, Emilia Romagna, and in Apulia, and we visited 24 cities, which you can see in the map, because we wanted to have uh, the, a, a city vari variation to estimate uh, our equations. So, um, this basically um, participation was in incentivized with a lottery and the prize was the phone and the survey was two hours long so it was quite long and included questions on like demographics, current and past employment, family history, interactions with Italians, values, beliefs on Italian values, social networks and also questions on like relocation choice. So these are uh, some of the, the main demographics of the people that we interviewed. So the respondents were like quite young. They were about, they were 27 years old on average. 30% of them were female. And uh, uh, the, their migration journey was quite long. The average was 14 months. And they had on average four years of education. And uh, they came from 27 different countries. Uh, the most represented countries were Nigeria, Mali, Ivory Coast, and Gambia. And the majority of them arrived by sea, even though the majority of uh, women arrived by flight. So, and uh, um, these are some descriptive statistics on employment, which is gonna be our dependent variable. And we see that roughly like 50% of the respondents uh, are employed. And uh, in uh, Apulia, the labor market conditions seem to be a little more favorable to migrants since probably maybe that's because we conducted the survey um, in summer. And uh, these instead are our, our like main measure of social integration that is uh, the number of daily and weekly interactions with Italians. And uh, the interesting thing here is that the median of the median value of daily interaction is zero. Um, so uh, the median is zero daily interaction with natives. And this also relates to the study that was, uh, I guess, that was presented before. And uh, um, low interactions are correlated with lower probability of being employed. And we see like lower interactions for women with children and higher interactions instead for males with children. So, and finally, we also elicited, we also measured like prosociality through hypothetical dictator games and uh, trust games. Okay, now I, I leave the floor to Ambra, who's gonna explain the empirical strategy and preliminary results. Yes, okay. So in terms of empirical strategy, um, we, explored, we exploit, as Francesca said, the potentially quasi-random variation of assignment of asylum seekers to cities. So just to remind you, our main question is basically if we can assign asylum seekers to Italian cities within the reception system in a way that increases both economic and social integration. So what we want to look at is the assignment to a city labor market and social media, but given your background and, how, and we want to understand how that influences your probability 
of both finding a job and interacting with Italians. So what we first need to do is to um, construct a measure of good match to a city, uh, both as far as economic and social outcomes are concerned. Okay, so our measure of economic match okay, is going to be the share of people in the city of destination who work if I can you go back for a slide. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so this is... Uh, Here. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. It's going to be um, the share of people in the city of destination who work in the same sector as the one in which the migrant worked before coming to Europe. And our measure of social match, in a way, is going to be um, a measure of belief match, which is basically going to capture the extent to which people in your region of assignment have beliefs that are similar to yours on core aspects of one's life. How do we construct that? We use um, our, some questions of our survey and some questions that were asked in the World Value Survey, a survey that is conducted in uh, many countries in the world, which are basically going to ask how important oh, each of these six domains are for you in life. And then there's like very much or not a lot. And these are family, friends, leisure and politics, work and religion. So we have these responses for people in Emilia Romagna, Puglia and Piemonte from the World Value Survey. And then we ask the same question to our asylum seekers and refugees um, so that then we are able to understand how proximate, how similar they are to the people um, in the region they were assigned to. So what we'll basically use is this index, which goes from zero to one, which is increasing in belief proximity or cultural proximity in a way. Our um, estimating equation is going to be this one. Um, so as I said, it's relying on the assumption that uh, assignment to CP is random or conditionally random, which means that we're able to regress the match, uh, which is the economic match or the belief match, which is M, on integration and the, our measures of integrations are going to be the probability of finding a, like finding a job or um, having Italian friends and inter interactions with Italians. We're going to control for individual characteristics that are available to officers that are allocating asylum seekers at the moment of their arrival and to um, some city characteristics measured in 2001. So our main hypothesis is that the closer you are to, uh, in a way, like the labor, the better the match, um, the higher the integration is going to be, either economic or cultural. Um, okay, so our identifying assumption is conditional random assignment of asylum seekers to cities, and um, which basically means that given uh, some variables uh, on which we're going to condition ass um, assignment is going to be assignment is going to be a random. How do we validate this? We have uh, two ways in which we're going to, in which we try to do this. One is qualitatively and the other one is quantitatively. quantitatively. Anda, you have three minutes. Yes, so I'm going to be very fast on this. So qualitatively, we just spoke to people who guaranteed us that they didn't have information basically, um, especially between 2013 and 2017, that they had to, um, quickly assign people to regions. And then we ask for data from the Ministry of the Interior who um, are kind of corroborating these hypotheses. And I'm going to skip on this very quickly to show you some preliminary results. So in terms of um, economic match, uh, the coefficient is not significant, but we do see that there is a positive correlation between the good match, being a good match, and the probability of being employed. In terms of social interaction, we do find that proximity in beliefs is uh, in, increases in a way daily interactions with Italian by 25%, which is, which is a lot. Um, another important thing that we did and we think is important is trying to understand whether there, there is a vitreous cycle of uh, perceived proximity. So what we think is that if you are um, assigned to a city that is proximate in your beliefs, 
It means it might mean, as we have seen, that you're going to have more interactions with Italians. That it might be then in in the future that you will uh, perceive them to be less different from you, and then this is going to gener generate a cycle of, in a way, social integration. And this is what we are trying to provide evidence for, because we ask people how different you think people are from you, and as you see, the um, correlation between interacting with Italians and perceiving them to be similar to you is positive. So just to conclude real quick, from our pilot, we think we learned that um, being like the match to the city might matter both in terms of uh, economic and social integration. Um, this might generate a virt virtual cycle of integration, which we think is extremely important to avoid social tensions and increase employment, the employment rate of refugees. In terms of our next steps, um, we think that the pilot that uh, Roberto Franceschi allowed us to do uh, was extremely helpful for us to understand the rough distribution of our main outcomes variable that were not collected before and also the main correlations at play. But now what we would like to do is to use administrative data, so collaborate with administrations to replicate the, st the study on a larger scale uh, and not with self-reported data, but we with administrative data. And then if we succeed in doing that, we would like to conduct a larger scale survey based on the one of our pilot in order to test uh, the mechanism that's at play uh, determining um, both social and economic integration. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. It's a really fascinating study and I think that many of us look forward to, to know what the final results will be. So I will now open the floor to questions. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. So thanks for your presentation. That's a very, it's a very interesting project, and uh, uh, it's a really fascinating type of data that you're collecting. So I have actually several questions uh, that uh, I'd like to ask you because I'm also working on similar topics. Uh, so I'll be very brief. Uh, so one is, given that you are asking all these questions, I was wondering whether you also asked something about the uh, type of visa that they have, what type of uh, protection that they have, what type of status they currently have, and how long it took them to obtain their current status. I think that is uh, worth eliciting if you're thinking of scaling up the survey. Um, secondly, I was, uh, uh, so if I didn't, if, if I understood correctly, maybe I missed something, but basically your measure of match uh, is based on uh, like employment experience and the values, but both of these actually are elicited at time T. So potentially these are clearly endogenous to the outcome, right? So uh, I wonder whether how you deal with these, whether you can rely on just some predetermined characteristics or whether some values like religion presumably is more likely to be predetermined Whereas, I don't know, attitudes toward friendship or whatever else is more easily uh, changed over time, or maybe there's some literature that suggests uh, what values are more easily changed than others. So, but I'm slightly concerned that both your measure of matches are uh, endogenous, basically. Can I respond real quick? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we will have another question from Carlo. Yes, good. Thank you for your questions, Tommaso. So in terms of, uh, visa like status we did ask so we asked them which kind of protections they had and in which status they were so if they're wait they were awaiting for the protection to be granted or um, if it was already granted so that's actually um, some data that we do have in terms of uh, endogeneity um, yes I partly agree with you in the sense that as far as values are concerned it is a concern because we do elicit them after they have migrated. So one thing that I can, we can bring as a, I guess, um, as help is that we do run the same test using the word value survey measure of the country um, of origin. So we did not report that because we have that for fewer, um, for fewer variable, for fewer respondents, but the um, the coefficient is quite similar and it's positive. But uh, I agree with you that perhaps using religion might be might be a better so like slow moving in a way slow moving values might be a better thing. In terms of employment, it is um, it is collected at time t, but it, we ask for employment 
uh, at times t minus one. So that uh, maybe it wasn't clear, but like the measure of matches use, using employment, uh, the last job that they had before coming to Europe. So that is uh, perhaps less endogenous because it's not really determined by the city itself. Um, I hope that helps. Thanks. Thank you. Carlo? Uh, just a, a question. The, the definition of good uh, economic uh, match in some way obscure the possibility of uh, complementarities. Uh, and this is, and uh, also the, in the short run, we can also, it obscures the possibility of complementarities. And in the long run, I see a kind of um, a trade off with the social mobility. So, uh, did you think about this problem? Uh, yeah, so I can try to answer. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not trivial that <laughs> a better match because we measure the match as the percentage of people working in the same sector in which you were working before arriving in Italy. And so, I mean, um, yeah, it's not trivial that a better match always leads to better labor market outcomes in the sense that maybe uh, it could also be the case that uh, um, people have better labor market outcomes uh, in cities where there are more, war more jobs uh, in uh, services, for instance, or in some particular uh, sectors. So, and then uh, uh, something interesting about like your question is that uh, um, it's, true, it's true that there are some there may be complementarities, but I mean, another question that another uh, outcome variable that it would be interesting to measure is like relocation choice, because these people are um, forced to remain in the city of assignment for like six months or two years for a certain period of time, and then they can relocate. So maybe people like with the worst match then can like will relocate more or something like this. Okay, so we are already ahead of time, unfortunately. So I will thank again Francesca and Ambra and ask Valentina to take Yeah, over. thank you. Thank you, Francesca and Ambra for this uh, amazing presentation. And um, so it's now um, the turn of uh, Samuele Davide Molli from um, a postdoc researcher at the Catholic University of Milan. So Samuele, please uh, switch on your camera and prepare for sharing your slides. Um, Samuele, as I said, is postdoc postdoctoral researcher uh, in sociology at the Catholic University of Milan, and is going to present his paper on migration, religion, and integration evidence from a study on ethnic churches in Milan and London. Sam Samuele, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Okay, hello to everyone. I'm very glad for this opportunity. So in this talk, I will present the relationship between religion, immigration, and integration. Um, this presentation represents a part of a study I did during my PhD experience. And for discussing this relationship, I consider the case of ethnic churches, which are churches established by Christian immigrants, both in the city of Milan and London. So in this talk, uh, um, I, will, I present three main themes. The first one relates to the role of religion in the lives of immigrants in terms of cultural identity. So our religion creates a cultural atmosphere where, in which migrants can mutually recognize. Uh, then starting from my fieldwork and starting from the storyline I was able to collect during my, during my fieldwork, I show the function uh, of religion for migrants. Then I present how migrants within their community create um, an alternative form of welfare. So a set of helps um, that are pivotal for the needs of, uh, of the members. So in this way, I conclude giving you a picture on how religion becomes a significant part of migration experience and how it can contribute to their integration. And I will also show the critics and the limits of this experience. Um, 
Um, so in terms of literature uh, about the role of religion within migration studies, it's important to underline two considerations that have generally influenced the, the, the Italian and also the European research. The first one is that religion is a topic uh, generally neglected within migration studies. Uh, and this is due to the long-term implications of the theory of secularization. So for most times, scholars and researchers believe that migrants would abandon their religiosity within a postmodern society. And the second beliefs relates to the issue of Islam in Europe. So we know how Islamic religion today represents a burning issue. And most people today believe that immigrants in Italy, as well as in Europe, are only Muslim. On the contrary, on the, contrary the majority of immigrants in Italy, but also in several European countries, are Christians. So um, I, I propose two, two lines of research for capturing the role of religion within migration studies, two views in which in which the study of religion can be advanced. The first one is a um, descriptive view, because we see the genesis of a new super religious pluralism in Europe. Uh, so the religious landscape is more complex than our perception, and there are um, new religious faith communities um, on one side imported in Europe by immigrants, but we have also new religious communities founded by immigrants within our mainstream uh, historical uh, denomination. For example, we have uh, new Protestant churches, new Evangelical churches, new Catholic churches, communities. Uh, on the other side, we have two inter interpretative ways uh, we use, sorry. Uh, the first one I call from inside, and this is the role of religion in migration experience at the individual level in terms of well being, in terms of psychological benefits, in terms of cultural identity. And the second one I call from outside, so the social, political, and civic implication of migrant religiosity mostly in terms of integration within our society. Um, uh, here uh, we see case studies and methodology. In particular, I, 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 I studied religious communities established by Catholic immigrants, both in the city of Milan and London. Um, so we know that these two cities are global socioeconomic hubs, but we, we also see new significant religious proce processes triggered by migration flows. So the multiculturalism, multiculturalism we see is also a question of religion. Uh, in particular, for example, in Milan, uh, we know that Catholicism is the mainstream religion but today we see as a significant part of believers are immigrants and they are silently replacing uh, not born believers. Um, uh, in London, I can affirm as Catholicism is only a matter of immigrants. Uh, we know Catholicism in England is a minority and today this minority is renewed only by immigrants. Uh, so in, uh, in, during my field work, I was able to collect uh, 75 in-depth interviews with believers and with religious responsible. And I did, uh, um, I collected uh, ethnographic data because I had the experience, I had an immersive experience within their religious and social activities for three years. And I was also able to collect a rich set of visual data. In particular, here, I can, start and I can show you um, a picture I took during my fieldwork in Milan, and it represents a religious item pivotal for most Latin American in the city. It represents one of the most important sanctuary within the city of Milan, where Latin Americans gather on Sunday. Uh, and here we can see how around this religious icon people gather on Sunday and create a communitarian experience. Similarly, 
Here we have a picture. Is it represents a religious item pivotal for Brazilians in the city of London, where I did my field work uh, with them. And around these people meet and have created one of the most important immigrant community, uh, the newest, one of the most important newest immigrant community in, uh, in the city of London. So um, in this way, I can show you as religion represent also a set of cultural markers and text to them, migrants create an atmosphere where they can mutually recognize um, a familiar place within a new unfamiliar place. Uh, so uh, religions transform in a tool to reproducing and inventing identity. It's like a cultural glue between the mother country and the receiving uh, society. Um, Moreover, um, uh, migrants typically in these two cities uh, transform marginal areas uh, into lively places because we have a lot of old churches abandoned by local believers. And migrants transform these marginal areas, uh, abandoned churches into new, new uh, religious communities. And finally, I can show you how these Religious places are not only religious places, but they become social landmarks within the city, meeting points where they can gather within the in Milan and London. So in this slide, I show you um, classification um, and uh, we can find how churches can provide different types of apps. Uh, um, churches, um, these are only ideal types, but they can help us to understand the role of churches for them, in, for migrants and their lives. So on the left, you can find common topics and themes emerged during the interviews with migrants. And on the right, you can find the function that churches are able to give to members. So in the first line, within boxes, we find issues like loneliness, the need of new family, the sense of solitude, and the church provides a space where migrants may find psychological answers that, that typically they don't find within everyday life and activities. So religion provides a peaceful space uh, different from ordinary life where to develop a new set of relations. In the second line, during the interviews, I often found themes like the everyday stress, like the obligation, the anxiety of living for a long period in a new and different context, as well as tensions linked to mother country. We know that migrants often have relatives in the, in the mother country and these create expect, expectations and also stress. Uh, so the church, serves for them as a space of resilience where they can soften this different form of stress. Here in this line, in the first line, we find a different, uh, different and more active function. We know that migrants face often job exploitation, stigma, and mostly legal and political exclusion. We can imagine the situation of irregulars. And in this case, migrants within their community create and find strategies of survival. Um, so the concept of resistance is different from resilience, which is more passive. Resistance is more active because migrants within their communities uh, can create um, strategies of survival and uh, they are externally excluded, but internally included. In the second line, um, uh, we find um, how migrants within their community can also present a new image of themselves, uh, a different image from the ordinary and everyday obligations implicating their jobs activity that typically require low skills. Uh, so the participation often involves the development of new position of responsibility and migrants can become leaders of their groups because we find different groups within the churches. This is an informal social mobility for them who can experience new position and develop new organizational skills within these churches. 
And this is another uh, important psycho psychological benefit. Finally, uh, another perspective to elaborate their religious involvement is to understand the moral attitudes implicated. So migrants within these churches look for a moral guide and a new moral orientation. Uh, they look for compasses for, to soften the impact uh, uh, of a new secular and postmodern society. So they can. Uh, Samuel, sorry to interrupt they, you. You have three minutes. So you have okay, three minutes. So I go. Thank you. So uh, they want to, to present it to show the churches as a deserved setting, uh, a different image from what people tend to think about migrants as dirty and dangerous places. So the churches are a set when they can develop an image of respectability for the city. So, um, uh, because during the research I have observed as migrants um, within the communities create a different set of mutual helps, uh, uh, a different uh, wide set of services uh, uh, able to, to sustain their material needs. Uh, um, so here we have a, a set of these, these uh, these forms of help because uh, uh, over the time they create internal groups for, for the reception of for survivors, they create formal help desks for the guidance and for legal needs, uh, food banks and other informal agencies for their jobs and information about uh, housing. So the church is moreover offered a sponsor fundraising to collect financial resources for um, help the believers in case of material needs, we can think to, to the health assistance, the medical assistance, uh, or for people who lost their jobs uh, during their experience as migrants. And moreover, believers tend to help each other, for also for the family support, for example, to provide childcare to the people who work all the day. So uh, to conclude, uh, I can claim that religious communities over the time become an alternative informal welfare for them in order to support their needs and their settlement in a new society. So yeah, the conclusion, uh, so I can, um, uh, I can claim that, uh, uh, so religious communities try to support migrants during their new experience. Uh, they transform in cultural, psychological, social, and welfare hubs in Milan and London. But it's important to underline as religion is not a panacea comparing to the structural disadvantage, but they try to support their integration within the city. And so the challenge of evolution, uh, not only so the activity sponsored within the communities, but also the integration uh, in the city, the civic evolution, and also the role of the second generation. And it's important to understand if religion will be a part of the inclusion or exclusion in uh, Milan and London. So I can finish here. And thanks, Valentina. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Every time I heard your presentation, I feel uh, uh, very happy. And I, I'm uh, very happy. And I want to share with you this, uh, this feeling of happiness because we had today very quantitative um, analysis, some qualitative studies, and then intersection between the two, and also experimental studies. And I really think that this is the way to go for science. Um, in the in the future. So thank you so much for your presentation and for the presentations we heard today. We have a question from the audience. So Juan, if you want to switch your camera on and um, ask your question, please feel free. Sure, but I think uh, Professor Ambrosini was first. No problem. Uh, yes, no sorry, problem, sorry. Uh, Juan Francisco, please. <laughs> okay, oh. thank you. Now, um, I had one uh, question because, well, actually, uh, Professor Ambrosini is also well aware of the role of organization of migrants, providing a lot of the um, services you described and what you described as the welfare from below, which I think is an, is an amazing term. So my, um, my main question would be, what is the added value of a religious organization versus non-religious organizations, specifically in the, in the, the topic that you have analyzed? Um, there are indeed... Um, non-religious organizations of Latin Americans also organized in different parts of Europe. Um, what would be the added value of the religious one? 
So during my, my field work, I was able to, to collect data on the fact that uh, religious communities tend to create an atmosphere where a mutual trust can be advanced uh, for their relationship uh, in terms of social capital, for example. So religion is a typical setting where people can create this, reinforce the mutual trust between people because the religious values are able to, to create this atmosphere and is a form of sociability. Um, so yeah, I did a, a qualitative uh, study uh, only within uh, uh, churches, but I am um, starting from my data, I'm able to, to give you a picture of how people within this community find a mutual recognition because there is a, there is a, a common atmosphere. And starting from here, they can create, develop relation, mutual trust. And then starting from here, from here, they can create a wide set of helps. So I think that religion is, a, is a, another interesting platform a communitarian experience to, uh, to elaborate in order to understand how people develop their relationship within our society. And so this is what I can, I can tell you, um, but there are also several implications starting from religion, so. Oh, thank, thank you, you. That, that indeed um, clarifies, thank you. Um, sorry, Professor Ambrosini, if you can go, I didn't. Uh... No problem. Uh, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Um, my question is about uh, the transnational dimension of religious communities. Uh, some uh, literature has uh, analyzed as religious communities provide uh, connections with the homeland uh, through pilgrimage, uh, for instance, uh, through visits of uh, religious leaders and so on. And one aspect uh, very interesting uh, is uh, the, the role in collecting collective remittances for social purposes in the homeland, for instance, in the occasion of natural disasters or emergencies. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, um, in this way, uh, especially religious communities are able to uh, develop a bridge with uh, the homeland that often is difficult to construct for other types of uh, immigrant uh, associations and uh, um, groups. Uh, in this way, I think I can also answer to Juan Francisco, uh, the collective organization of immigrants is uh, difficult in Italy. Uh, associations are weak, weaker than in other countries in uh, Europe. And, uh, I think that uh, religious communities uh, represent a kind of exception or an anticipation of uh, um, a collective uh, um, activity by immigrants in our country. Please. I, I can give you um, a picture on this because in a part, in a small part of my PhD uh, thesis, uh, I wrote a chapter on transnational activities sponsored by these churches. In particular, there is um, a paragraph on what we can call as a transnational welfare from below. So the idea that uh, churches sponsor forms of helps for the settlement of immigrants, but they typically get, um, meet and collect resources and forms of helps also for the homeland. And these resources are able to directly hey. the needs of, uh, of their relatives, for example. So uh, their welfare has also this um, side. So uh, they trans we can call this as a transnational welfare from below. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, the time is over, but this amazing okay. conversation can uh, continue. Um, in, uh, in, um, in parallel. So thank you so much, Samuel, for your amazing presentation. Thank you so much for the questions coming from, from, coming from, the, from the audience. And uh, now I leave the floor to Simone. Thank you, Valentina. So we are coming to the last presentation of the day. So I would ask Miriam to share the screen.
And in the meantime, let me, Miriam, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in the meantime, let me introduce Miriam Tomasualo, who is a PhD student in economics and finance at the Catholic University of Milan, and who is going to present her work titled Gambler's Behavior, a Field Investigation. Miriam, the floor okay, is yours. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the screen? The screen, yes, but not the slides. Okay, now my computer take a little bit time. Okay, now it's okay. Uh, no. Can you see slides? Yes. Okay. We can. Okay. So uh, thank you, Simone, and thank you uh, for the possibility to present my work. Um, my name is Miriam Tomasualo, and uh, this work um, is basically my PhD thesis. Uh, so the research uh, is a field investigation on the war of gambling. And uh, um, so, no, it's not work, maybe. Okay, so what is uh, problematic gambling? Problematic gambling or pathological gambling is an addiction uh, characterized by a persistent and compulsive desire to engage in gambling activity. Uh, in the last definition given from the American Psychiatric Association, uh, we find the first formal recognition of gambling as a behavioral addiction, uh, so the same of drug addiction. And um, it is important to study this phenomenon, um, mainly because nowadays it constitutes uh, really a very social plug, both for the rate of uh, its diffusion and also for the social cost that uh, it brings. Um, so we focus our attention on three research points. So we start from uh, investigate the existing correlation between gambling disorder and individual characteristics. As individual characteristics, uh, I include socioeconomic uh, traits and behavioral traits. After we move to inspect um, whether exists a causal effect between gambling activity and behavioral traits. So we want to understand whether gambling activity causally impact behavioral traits. And in the last part of the work, um, we focus our attention on some interesting patterns of the gambling activity. Um, since we don't have so much time, I will skip the literature and I'm going to present the, um, to explain the experiment. So I collect all the data using a field experiment. Um, the experiment was conducted in a very large betting agency in Milan. Uh, in this agency, customers can find different types of games, so horse races, virtual games, VLT and sports. And uh, we end up with a sample of 90 subjects. Um, before to explain the experiment, I want to um, tell, to explain um, the measures we used to, to, um, in our research. So the first important measure is, the, is how we uh, capture the level of gambling addiction. Um, we use the DSM-5 criteria, that is one of the most important criteria um, used, used in this context. It's added uh, from the American Psychiatric Association, and it's a questionnaire composed uh, from nine items. So this questionnaire allows us to classify a subject as a problem gambler or not. And the interesting point uh, here is that 62% of our sample can be classified as a problem gambler. Um, so the second important measure uh, I want to, to explain are those regarding behavioral traits. Uh, so with this term, I want to include both risk and time preferences. Um, we test these preferences using several types of uh, tasks. However, the, the most important is the multiple price list prospect. That is the one I'm showing in the slide. 
uh, here in the case uh, for the case of risk aversion. So people, um, participant has to choose between a lottery and a, sh and a sure amount. And this uh, um, give us the, 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 the individual level for each behavioral trait. So at the end, we end up with um, uh, every, um, uh, an individual measure for each behavioral trait for each participant. And we inspect the risk aversion, loss aversion, time preferences, uh, probability weighting propensity, ambiguity averse, aversion, and gambler fallacy. Um, okay, so methodological problem. After having observed um, the existing correlation between gambling disorder and individual characteristics, we move to the causality. So we want to understand whether gambling activity affects behavioral traits. In order to do this, uh, we split our experiment in three parts. So at the beginning, uh, time one, uh, we test the behavioral traits for each participant. After that, we leave participants to uh, gamble freely in the agency. So they can choose uh, every type of games present in the agency and they um, bet with their own money. At the end of this part that I call free gambling session, uh, I retest behavioral traits. So in this way, uh, I can have um, a comparison between the behavioral trait pre-gambling and the behavioral trait post-gambling. Um, and since our assumption is that the more is the time spent gambling, the more or different is the impact on the behavioral traits, we are randomly allocate our sample into different treatment conditions. So uh, half of our sample um, participate in a short session of gambling, just one hour. The other half uh, gamble for four hours, so a long session of gambling. And this in order to observe if the impact um, on the behavioral trait is different. Uh, the, I want to say that during the free gambling session, uh, the only requirement is that uh, the participants has to uh, give us back all the receipts, so all the tickets back during the session. And uh, this ticket uh, contain interesting information because um, they uh, tell us the, the type of the game used, the time of the mission, odds and money stacked on each gamble and the result of the gamble. So uh, we, in this way, have, can take trace of all the history of the free gambling session for each participant. And these data uh, are the data that I call real observation data. Mm. So now I'm going to present the results. I start from the first point, so uh, from the correlation existing between gambling disorder and individual characteristics. Um, in this table, um, I start showing correlation between gambling disorder and socioeconomic traits. So um, we split our sample into group, the group composed by the non-problematic uh, gambler and the group composed from problematic gamblers. And um, what is interesting here is that uh, gambling disorder brings some marginalities in terms of socioeconomic status. Uh, this because of the problematic group is more likely to be young, immigrant, and below income level. Um, in this table, um, I show the correlation between gambling disorder and the type of the game used uh, from gamblers. Uh, here, the, 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 the interesting point is that strategic gambles, as in the case of horse races, um, is chosen, is used from gamblers that are significantly more likely to be non-problematic. On the contrary, the non-strategic gambles, so virtual games, are more likely to be chosen from gamblers that are problematic. Um, and finally, in this table, I show the differences between uh, problematic and non-problematic concerning uh, behavioral traits. 
So um, I want to say that we did not find uh, a very strong existing correlation between gambling disorder and behavioral traits because uh, um, the only trait that seemed to differ between the two groups uh, is loss aversion. And the problematic uh, group, so um, problematic gamblers are more loss tolerant. So they tolerate more losses. And uh, this is perfectly in line with the, um, what the literature uh, predict. Um, then uh, after that, we moved to, stu to study the causality. So we, we compare behavioral trait pre and post gambling. Um, and we compare, uh, we compare the difference of the behavioral trait pre and post gambling. And even, even in this case, uh, we did not find a very strong um, causal effect between gambling and behavioral traits. Uh, the only differences, so the only trait that seems to be affected is loss aversion. And uh, however, uh, um, there, we find a modification in loss aversion, but this modification regards only the problematic group. And it is not related uh, to the length of time spent gambling. Milano? We test uh, the you same thing. Minutes. What? You, you still have three minutes to go. Oh, okay. Okay, we test the same things so using a parametric analysis, but the results are quite the same. And uh, now um, I go to the last part of the work. So until now, we use the data coming from experimental observation, experimental data. In this last part of the work, uh, we use data coming from a real observation, so from the free gambling session. And uh, um, so we know from the literature that usually gamblers uh, spend more money and more time than they had planned uh, before starting gambling. And this is a common view in the literature. Uh, one possible ex explanation could be that uh, gambling activity itself can have an effect of desensibilization to war losses. Uh, so we investigate this hypothesis. Um, how we did this, uh, we test whether uh, the net amount of money lost during the gambling activity until at a given time influence the risk that uh, gamblers are willing to take in subsequent bets. So we use a dynamic panel data regression. The dependent variable is the variable is the risk that subject I take at time T. And the explicative variable is the net amount of money lost until the previous time. And in this case, uh, we find a confirmation of our hypothesis because the net amount of money lost uh, rise the risk that gamblers are willing to take in subsequent bets, either if we consider risk the potential gain or if we consider a risk the, total, the, the, the amount of money taken on the, the current bet. Uh, so to sum up uh, the conclusion, when we look at the result coming from the experimental task data, uh, we, the, the, we find that there is some marginality um, that is connected with the uh, gambling addiction and these marginalities regard the, the socioeconomic status. Um, however, we, do, we did not find a causal effect between gambling activity and behavioral traits. Uh, when we look at the result coming from the real uh, gambling data, we find an interesting result uh, that is that the, the higher are the losses collecting due the, during the gambling activity, the higher is the risk that uh, the gamblers are willing to take in subsequent bets. However, uh, we are not able to distinguish which is the, the trait that drive this uh, um, these results, so can be an increase in loss tolerance or an increase in the risk tolerance. Um, so what can we learn uh, from this? Uh, the result underline important differences between real and experimental observation. So it seems that we have to carefully compare those preferences that uh, are elicit using experimental task with the preferences that are a direct expression of the actual gambling uh, behavior, gambler's behavior. And more that gamblers seems to be not risk seekers individual in general, uh, but it seems that 
they risk propensity rise when they, they are directly involved in the gambling activity. Um, okay, so thank you for uh, uh, your attention and a special thanks for uh, Fondazione Franceschi that uh, made possible my work. Um, and thank, I, thank you, Miriam. I, thank you so much. So this is a very interesting and fascinating. So we are going a, a little bit over and we have a few minutes for our questions. If someone wants to ask one, please un unmute yourself. So I'll... I'll ask a, a, a question. So the, 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 the point is that 60% of, uh, uh, of, the, of the sample are problematic uh, or very heavy gamblers. So I, I'm wondering what type of effect uh, are you searching for in the sense that is one or four hours of treatment for the heavy gamblers. And uh, I'm a little bit confused on the world behavioral characteristics or preferences. That seems to me very uh, or deep uh, characteristic of the individual. It seems to me that you are uh, kind of uh, uh, searching for the short term strategies after the uh, a, a big money loss, for instance. So I, I'm a little bit confused between behavioral uh, characteristic uh, utility of the individual and the strategy that after the four hours in which I lost uh, uh, 200 euros, I, I try everything to recover the money I, I just lost. N not, not sure I was clear enough, sorry. Okay, so you're asking um, the link between uh, the behavioral traits and uh, the treatment we used, I'm right? No, basically, uh, in general, if I treat uh, a, someone, somebody with, with something, uh, this person has not been treated before, but these people, 60% of these people are treated by uh, gambling for years. They are pathological gamblers. Yes. So I, I'm wondering whether three hours more of gambling, whether you expect to have any effect on, on this deep uh, parameter of uh, the, the, uh, the, the person, of uh, the uh, risk aversion of the person. Other question is if after the one uh, four hours of gambling in which I lose a lot of money, then I change the strategy. So I don't change myself, but I just change my, my strategy to come back home with uh, enough money to buy for the food my, my, my wife just asked me to, to buy. So um, it's, uh, it seems to me that the treatment of, of four hours gambling in a group of pathological gamblers is something very, very soft. Okay, so uh, first of all, of course, this can be the case. Um, however, we, uh, we, um, we use an exogenous treatment. So in the sense that we decide in a random way, uh, if a short or long session of gambling, uh, our our assumption, our hypothesis was that uh, uh, even in a short time, so we did the same day, a long time spent uh, gambling can have a different impact on behavioral trait uh, with respect to short time. And so uh, uh, a modification in the behavioral trait uh, could explain uh, um, why they end up spend more money and more time than they had planned. Um, so uh, there are, of course, maybe this effect uh, um, can be more strong in the long run. So we have to observe gamblers uh, in all the, the gambling history. Uh, but the, the, 
the assumption is was that uh, we can observe a slight variation in the risk propensity in the, in the loss aversion propensity even within the same day so that, that, that also uh, a different time within the same day could uh, modify the behavioral traits and this could explain uh, why uh, they end up spending more money or, or and more time that, that, that they want. Um, however, however, we did not find uh, this causal effect. So um, we did not find that uh, um, gambling activity affect behavioral traits. In a short, in a short, uh, in a short run. Okay, thanks. So we are ahead of time. So we will wrap up, wrap up and conclude. Thank you, Miriam. So Thank I, you. I suggest that we could maybe switch on the camera if you want. So since we don't have a single speaker anymore. I know that Asia want to add something. So Asia, if you want to unmute yourself and, and tell us. Thank you so much, uh, everybody who presented today. I was really fascinated with all the exciting, innovative research that you are doing. And on behalf of the uh, IMISCO network, the network of international migration and social cohesion, I would like to bring to your attention uh, an interactive um, library of uh, research on migration that is called Migration Research. Asia, we cannot hear you anymore. <laughs> Hello? Yeah I, yeah, I put the link in the chat. So uh, we created this uh, repository of migration studies uh, um, to, for everybody who works on migration and ethnic relations to benefit from knowledge sharing with each other. So please feel free to use this database and it's completely free. And also since you are um, experts on migration or aspiring to be experts on migration, I invite you to add yourself and create your profile uh, in this migration research hub and be part of our expert database and connect with other colleagues all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Asia. So I I will say a few a few words to to conclude. The first thing that I wanted to say is that uh, I'm really really impressed by all the presentation that uh, that I saw today. Um, you were uh, answering important questions, uh, being creative with methods, spending a lot of efforts, uh, a lot of effort to collect new data. You did a very good job. So let me congratulate you all. And and then I would like to conclude by saying two things. One is for the for the speakers. So as 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 Carlo was saying at the beginning, I think that uh, that you should not see the um, the award and the research that you that you just conclude as a as the end of something, but at the as the beginning of something else. In the sense that uh, you are now part of a of a network. Of researchers that you should see as a, as a place where, where to find kindred spirits, not just to 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 find uh, research collaborations, but most of all, uh, thanks to also to the to the work that Fondazione Franceschi uh, does all the time with us uh, as a place where to find people, where to collaborate to make our research matter. I think that this is something really important that. Um, that the Fondazione continues to do. So please uh, stay in touch and I hope that we will see each other soon. And then um, the last thing that I want to say is for the, for the rest of the world, let's say, uh, that is that we have a, a, new, uh, a new iteration of the, of the grant that is, uh, that is uh, approaching. So the deadline is in four days. So please, if you are a, a student with a research uh, proposal, please apply. And if you know uh, people that may be interesting, interested, please spread the word and, uh, and push them to, to advance their proposal. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope that we will see in person soon. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Valentina. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.